Okay. Well, tonight we're picking up on the uh, uh, First Samuel chapters eight through twelve tonight. We did uh, one through seven last week. Uh, we're covering eight through twelve tonight. And uh, can I have the remote, please? I mean, the mouse, please, ma'am. There we go. And like uh, last week, oh, let's see. Like last week, uh, I've got some slides in here that are for y'all's benefit. Uh, if y'all want to pause and do a screenshot or whatever, these are very good references. Uh, this one, the panorama of biblical history. We are after the Exodus. We are right here uh, just before uh, David becoming king. So we're right here, right about in this area right here in the panorama of history. Now the monarchy, we are beginning the monarchy tonight. This is when Samuel anoints Saul to be the king of Israel. Okay? And we are in the book of 1 Samuel. And I'm not going to re-explain all of this, but uh, the, this is just a good reference material for y'all. And then the rise and fall of the monarchy, First and Second Samuel, Samuel saw David, First and Second King, David's forty-year reign, Solomon, the divided kingdom, and then First and Second Chronicles is a recap of the Southern Kingdom, uh, which went by the name of Judah. This is after the king uh, Israel was divided up, uh, after Solomon had, uh, you know. Since you were a little kid, you were taught that Solomon was the wisest man in the Bible, but Apparently he wasn't wise enough because the very things that we're going to talk about tonight uh, are the, is some of the main things that caused the, the downfall of Solomon's uh, well, he may reign. Have, he may have been the, the smartest, but that just tells how dumb the rest of us are. Well, that's true. But then uh, instead of him <clears throat> remaining the wisest, he, he fell into some bad things. I understand. Uh, I agree. And God predicted that if they would do these things, here's what's going to happen to you. And sure enough, uh, Solomon couldn't hold steadfast. Let's put it that way. Admit, Barbara, again, I think she's having trouble. All right, there we go. Now, where are we? Well, i uh, remind you right now, we're still in the period after uh, we're getting toward the end, end of Judges. If y'all remember, uh, Israel was not near the nation God had ordained for it to be. And so Israel was surrounded by the Philistines, the Hivites, the Phoenicians, Amorites, Ammonites, and we're going to hear about the Ammonites tonight, Moabites, the Edomites. Uh, if y'all remember, uh, during the judges period, uh, various ones of these foreign countries that state that, that Israel didn't get rid of, would make uh, forays into certain parts of Israel and basically uh, hold the Israelites captive. And after they suffered enough, and obviously it was because of their sin, after they suffered enough, uh, you know, they cried out to God and God would give them a judge to, to come in and, and beat them back. But it, it was always, it was just a cycle. It would, uh, they'd have good years and bad years and it was a hundred percent tied to, uh, their sinfulness. So that's where we are. And uh, we ended up last time, this is just the very tail end of, of chapter seven. Uh, Samuel was a circuit rider like Deborah. I, I don't know if y'all grew up um, countrified like we were, but um, where we grew up at Forest Hill, we didn't know about such things as circuit preachers. But uh, we had aunts and uncles and cousins who went to churches out in rural areas of Mississippi where, uh, you know, they only had church uh, every, you know, their church may have it the uh, first Sunday of a month and somebody else's church would somewhere else would have a church on the second Sunday of the month. And the same preacher would basically make a circuit, uh, you know, depending on what the denomination was. And that's what a circuit preacher in the South was 
was referred to as a circuit preacher. They didn't have just one church they were uh, preaching at and trying to be, uh, you know, consider their flock. They had to travel. Well, that's what uh, Samuel did uh, at the end of chapter seven. He made a circuit. Uh, Samuel's home was at Ramah, and he would travel from Ramah to Gilgal to Bethel to Mizpah back to Ramah, and uh, that's where uh, until the time of uh, Samuel appointing his sons as judges and the people start mumbling and grumbling and belly aching, uh, this is what, what Samuel did right here, okay? Now, when are we? Well, uh, the birth of Samuel was about 1120 B.C. The point in time we're going to cover tonight is, is Samuel is about 65 to 70 years old. And remember, before the birth of Christ, we counted down in years. So 1120, when you count down 65 or 70 years, that means that we are right at around the time of 1055 to 1050 BC. This is the time when Saul is anointed king. Okay, we want our own king. This is 1 Samuel chapter 8. This is starting tonight's lesson. We want our own king. Now it came to pass when Samuel was old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel. The name of his second was Abijah. They were, he let Barbara in. They were judges in Beersheba. If you remember Beersheba, Beersheba's way down in the Southland. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you're old. Your sons don't walk in your ways. Make us a king to judge us like all the other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. Samuel was a big believer in prayer. That's one of the things that um, anytime you hear a preacher or a teacher talking about Samuel, they're always going to reference the fact that Samuel had no hesitancy at all to, to call on, on the Lord um, for guidance, for answers, uh, to, to hear his appeal, his cries, his, his moanings and groanings. Uh, he he didn't hesitate at all to call on the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, heed the voice of the people and all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Remember, Moses had predicted a king over Israel. Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 20. I'm not going to read that for you, but just to say, uh, in Deuteronomy, if you remember how far back that is now, uh, Moses said that God said, when you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you and possess it and dwell in it and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses, one from among your brethren. You shall set his king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you, one who is not your brother but he shall not multiply horses for himself nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Uh, well, that, there you go. That verse 17 is the one that was Solomon's downfall. Definitely. It's always the women. So Deuteronomy 17 is where Moses predicted that Israel was going to have a king. Now, be careful what you wish for. Now, there, this is, we're back in Samuel now. Heed their, this is God talking to Samuel. Heed their voice. However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king. And he said, this will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots to be his horsemen, some to run before the chariots. He will appoint captains. Uh, he will set some to plow his ground and reap his harvest and some to make weapons of war. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, bakers. He'll take the best of your fields, your vineyards, your olive oil groves, and give them to his servants. 
He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officers and servants. He will take your male servants, your female servants, your finest young men, and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your sheep and you will be his servants. And you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and they said, no, but we will have a king over us that we also may be like all the other nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. So God said, you're going to you're going to tell them what's going to happen. You're going to solemnly warn them. Be careful what you He's wish for. Take your stuff. They're going to this 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 and this. And they said, "No, we want a king." We we hear you. We still want a king. Yep. Well, be careful what you wish for, because you just might get it. Well, the people's motivations were many. Samuel was old and in his lean years. Samuel's sons were not godly. Couldn't be expected to change their ways. The nation had suffered through great highs and lows during the period of the judges with no permanency in the form of a leader. And they wanted somebody, a single leader who had some permanency who would, quote, go out before us to fight our battles. Saul is identified. Now we move to 1 Samuel chapter 9. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish. A Benjamin, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power, and he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. Saul and uh, and uh, I'm, you know, one thing we've tried to make sure we we've told y'all we're not going to read. This is not a read the Bible through in a year type thing. We're not reading the Bible word for word. Some of it we're trying to, to bring out major points to you, and then some of it we're going to encapsulate. Well, this is the rest of 1 Samuel chapter 9. Saul and a trusted young servant went looking for some lost donkeys. They looked for quite a while, traveled quite a ways from home. They were about to give up and return home, but the servant told Saul, you're not going to believe this, but right over here at this town is a city where Samuel, the national prophet we've heard about, would be. And, you know, I bet if we can get a hold of him, he can tell us wh where our donkeys are and uh, how to get back home. Was that something he did on, that wasn't something he did on a regular basis to, to like, be a soothsayer type person, was it? Well, he was actually called a seer. I know he was called a seer, but I thought that just meant that there he... Were, no, there were two different words. Uh, he was called a prophet, and the Hebrew word for prophet was used. He's also called a seer, and the word a Hebrew word for seer was used. So yes, so he was believed to be both. Sure was. Somehow that doesn't seem right, but go ahead. I mean, it doesn't seem. I'm not saying you're not right in, about it. I'm just saying, I just didn't think that the Lord's prophet was supposed to be like a, you know, go see the lady with the hands in her house. <laughs> no, that's not a, what. He wasn't doing it for money or gain or, or anything like that. It's just that uh, when P, he was, he was, remember, he was also a judge. So he had a, he had a direct line to God. So if they went and asked him, say, Hey, would you please ask God? What, what about this? What about that? You know, uh, he was believed by the people to have those answers, to be able to get those answers. That's what his reputation was. Okay. Saul is chosen. This is 1 Samuel 9, 15. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear the day before Saul came saying, tomorrow about this time, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin and you shall anoint him commander. Anoint him, the Hebrew word for commander is actually ruler over my people that he may save my people from the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people because their cry has come to me. So when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, there he is, the man of whom I spoke to you. This one shall reign over my people. Now, unbeknown to Saul, Jehovah had just, excuse me, just the day before, told Samuel to be looking for the one chosen to be Israel's first king. Saul was intimidated by the attention he was getting from Samuel, and Samuel 
basically treated Saul and his companion like Samuel's special guest at the feast. And they're like, we just came here to get find out where the we just came to find out where donkeys were. Uh, that gives you the the. I mean, Saul was uh, naive. He was unlearned. He he was. He wasn't seeking a kingship. No, no, okay. no. He was not, and that's why he needed the help from the Lord. You'll find here short. But Saul is anointed king. First Samuel, we move to chapter ten. Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, "Is it not because the Lord has anointed you ruler over his, his inheritance?" When you have departed from me today, you will find two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelza. And they will say to you, the donkeys which you went to look for have been found. And now your father has ceased caring about the donkeys and he's more worried about you. Saying, what shall I do about my son? Then you shall go on forward from there and come to the terebinth tree of Tabor. There three men going up to, to God at Bethel will meet you, one carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine. And they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall receive from their hands. After that, you shall come to the hill of God where the Philistine garrison is. And it will happen when you have come there to the city that you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with a stringed instrument, a tambourine, a flute, and a harp before them. And they will be prophesying. And get this. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. And let it be when these signs come to you that you do as the occasion demands, for God is with you. You shall go down before me to Gilgal. I wish I knew what that looked like. I wish I knew what prophesying looked like. Like, I wish I knew, I mean, were they com really good about the script, knowing the scripture and they were, they were saying all that, were they, I mean, we think of prophet prophesying as somebody who tells the future, but that's not necessarily that what that means, is it? No. Well, and, and part of the clue here is the fact that they, they had a, they were accompanied by a string, somebody playing a stringed instrument. Somebody playing on a tambourine, somebody uh, uh, making music with a flute, and then somebody picking a harp. So, it, so it's almost like they were having worship. Having praise and worship, that's right. Okay, and so obviously praise and worship, you know, was doctrinally sound with them. Like, I mean, you know, they were t well, like using words of uh, scripture and things to construct like the psalms and things like that well when you think of praise and worship and, and lord have mercy when we get over into the new testament well as when we get into more of uh king david and the tabernacle of david and the psalms i mean one of the things we'll study is praise and worship entering into the presence of god well, we by see, your praise and worship. Well, we see the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you. So we're talking about the Holy Spirit there. Exactly. So he's exactly. going to be enabled to do whatever it is that they're doing. And we know that they had instruments with them. And we know prophesying could be like preaching, uh, but that he would be able to do that too. Well, he, he at this point, he's a donkey hunter. He's a donkey hunter. That's a good way and, to put it. And he, he has not been... Uh, done this before so he is going to look like them because he's going to be turned into a new man when he gets to, to this point okay and that, and Sonar's bringing up some good points here notice in this uh, on this uh, tab what do we call these slides mm -hmm. on this slide I've highlighted two sections and I have a reason for having done that the Lord the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance. The Lord has anointed you ruler over his inheritance. What is his inheritance? Do we remember that? What, what, that what, would be the nation. What, what is meant by the Lord's inheritance? He said his inheritance, his portion was the nation of Israel. Exactly. That comes from where? Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, 
He set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God, for Yahweh's portion is his people. Jacob is the allotment of his inheritance. God basically said, I've had enough. If y'all remember that, I've had enough. At least for a little while, y'all go. I, I'm I'm tired of trying. It's like herding cats, trying to push a rope up a wall. I'm going to keep the nation of Israel for me, and I'm concentrating on them, and they're going to be mine. That's where that phrase came from, Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9. Now, what about the, the bottom part? This is what uh, uh, Sonar got us to pause and, and think about. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. Well, let's look at it in detail. The Hebrew word used for turned, Hapak, Hapak would be the word that we would understand as turn around or repent. If we were saying, uh, what does it mean for somebody to repent? It means make like a 180, mm -hmm. okay? Well, Hapak, the Hebrew word Hapak has that connotation to it. You will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. In other words, you won't be what you what you have been. You won't be traveling the road you've been traveling on. You're going to make a major change. Okay. <clears throat> Other English versions translate the word as change. The Hebrew word for another, uh, a hair, would be better understood as a better form of man, not just exchanging Bob for Jim or Charlie for. For Joe, but uh, what it means is a better form. In other words, a major improvement. A major improvement how? Well, well do you remember last week we studied the three things we studied? Uh, we talked about you can be informed, you can be conformed, and then transformed. Transformed, right. So, well, that's why this, that's why we're slowing down here and we're covering this, this, uh, passage in, in first Samuel because this is the description of Saul now uh is Saul being treated the same way we are as believers in the New Testament the answer is no 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 okay there are promises made to the church there are promises made to uh us as believers members of hang on a second gotta move my there we go that were not made to Old Testament people, as as you will see, uh, as we continue studying the Old Testament. Now you got to remember, and, and I didn't make a point of um, making a slide for this, but the last book of the Old Testament is the book of Malachi. Do we agree with that? Mm. Okay. But when did the Old Testament age end? Does anybody know that? I think I know. Go ahead. I think it would be uh, at the crucifixion of Jesus or the resurrection. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Old Testament period. Is, the Old Testament period not a ended. New covenant until. The Old Testament period ended with John the Baptist. That's not theology from Key. That's not theology from Sonora. That is theology straight from Jesus himself. Uh, go to go to. Uh, I think that was close, wasn't it? Well, you were close. <laughs> okay, but I believe it's uh Matthew eleven and Luke chapter sixteen is where Jesus says uh, that all the prophets in the law ends with John the Baptist. Yeah, that's true. And so, even though you had four hundred years of history between the last book of the Old Testament and the first uh, gospel, the birth of, of Jesus. The Old Testament age did not end until John the Baptist. And like I said, that is straight from the from the words of Jesus. And that's such a transition there for John the Baptist because you remember they were talking about this guy's preaching a uh, baptism of repentance. Mm -hmm. And there'd never been anything like that before, you know, before that. So go ahead, Ernie. Okay. Uh, let me see. I'm going to go back a little bit. You shall go down before me to Gilgal. Okay, where is Gilgal? Remember Gilgal. 
that was the place where when the Israelites crossed over from the east side of the Jordan River to get ready to go into the promised land, this is where they stopped first. And they had to, they had a prayer meet before they tackled uh, uh, Jericho, which is right close to it, right in this area here. Okay. Well, guess what's not on that map? Jericho. Why? Because Jericho was basically a pile of rubble by this time. It's gone. All right. Now, guess what else is not on this map? Now, this is a map of the time we're, to, we're, we're covering tonight. So guess what else is not on there? Yeah. Jerusalem. Let's go say Jerusalem, but I'm... Jerusalem. Why is Jerusalem not shown on this map? Well, it wasn't Jerusalem yet, right? Well, there was a Jerusalem. It just wasn't a very prominent city, yeah. and it certainly wasn't a prominent city to the nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. When did Jerusalem become a prominent city to the nation of Israel? When David captured it and made it his so his. We're we're not to David yet. We're definitely not there yet. Correct. Okay. Which is why I'm saying it's not on this map because what this map is for is to show you basically major cities that existed that existed at the time we're talking about. Samuel. And remember, uh, Aphek, Ekron, Gath, these were uh, Philistine cities that the, the Philistines had taken. Um, but at the end of chapter seven, you remember when, when they had, when uh, Samuel had basically kicked the stuffings out of the Philistines and it said, Hey, the Philistines didn't bother the Hebrews much anymore after that. Israel took over these cities again and they, they started uh, controlling them. Now it doesn't mean they ran the Philistines completely out, but at this point in time, what had actually happened is if there were any left there at all, they were mainly figureheads that had to pay tribute to the nation of Israel. Okay. But that's where Gilgal is. And that's where Samuel, and this is an odd thing. Samuel told Saul to go and wait for him there for seven days. And it's kind of like when you read that passage and then you keep going, it's like, that's just stuck out there in midair. Hmm. Wait, wait till you see the next slide. I hadn't slide. thought about that. It's, it, it, it really is. It's like it's just stuck out there in midair. If it's weird, we got to look at it. Exactly. All right. The significance of what we just talked about is manifested. So it was when he had turned his back to go from Samuel that God gave him another heart. And, and guess what word is used? Hapek. Hapek. Meaning basically God changed Saul's heart. He wasn't naive. He wasn't innocent. He wasn't just a farmer. He had attributes that he was given to become a man, to become a kingly man. Okay. From a goat herd, goat goat seeker. From a donkey seek donkey hunter to a to a, a king. A, a king. Okay. And all those signs came to pass that day. When they came there to the hill, there was a group of prophets to meet him. Then the Spirit of God came upon him and he prophesied among them. And it happened when all who knew him formerly saw that he indeed prophesied among the prophets that the people said to one another, what is this that has come upon the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? Then a man from there answered and said, but who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb. Is Saul among the prophets? And when he had finished prophesying, he went to the high place. Then Saul's uncle said to him and his servant, where did you go? And he said, to look for the donkeys. When we saw that they were nowhere to be found, we went to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, well, tell me what Samuel said to you. Saul said to his uncle, he told us plainly that the donkeys had been found. But about the matter of the kingdom, he did not tell him what Samuel had said. He didn't tell him that he had been anointed? He didn't tell him he had been anointed king. And it, let me tell you what, what my future is going to look like. All he knew was that he was not the same. Is that not what salvation looks like for the believer? Is is are we are we not, you know? Well, we were talking about being transformed. Yeah, we we're transformed, but transformed to what? Transformed for what? Transformed to go where? But Trans why, why did he not tell him what Samuel had said? Well, that's that's we're at a point where we can ponder over things. Okay. 
Why did he not tell him? It's got to be a reason. Got to be a reason. Could it be that he didn't know what to tell him? He didn't want to sound like, look. I've just, I, I I've just been made king. Now, <laughs> that might be a little far-fetched, you know. We don't know how far that transformation, you know, went with Saul. He could have been downright, you know, a little bit dumb before he left go and looked for those donkeys. I don't know. You we, know, we just might. we just don't know why he would be silent about it. Other than, I mean, couldn't it just be that that he still okay, shock himself? Let's, let's go here for just a second. If he was filled with the Holy Spirit at at that point that it said he was, and the Holy Spirit is still with him, enabling him, and perhaps him. he was kept by the Holy Spirit from telling. That's a great him. point. That is a great point. As y'all can tell, uh, Keith did this by himself. I'm trying to catch up, just like y'all are. So, <laughs> Saul is proclaimed king, 1 Samuel chapter 10. Then Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah and said to the children of Israel, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt and delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all kingdoms from those who oppressed you. But you have today rejected your God who himself saved you from all your adversities and your tribulations. And you have said to him, no, set a king over us. Now, therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your clans. And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was chosen. How did they do it? It could have been the drawing of lots. We know that <laughs> drawing of lots was, so, was uh, used a lot in biblical times by biblical people. Okay. When he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was chosen. And then out of that family of Matri, Saul, the son of Kish, was chosen. But when they sought him, he could not be found. Therefore, they inquired the Lord further. Has the man come yet? And the Lord answered, there he is, hidden among the equipment. Basically, what what, what you're being shown here is a, is a picture of, uh, obviously, Every body could not all gather in one place of the nation of Israel like they used to could do. Okay. Some had to stay there and, you know, tend, tend the sheep. Some had to stay and uh, uh, make sure uh, things were looked out for and, and that they wouldn't have stuff stolen by marauding bands and all. Okay. But there were so many people who were representatives of all these tribes that. Uh, when they came together, they had, you know, all their 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 carts, their donkeys, their their camels, whatever, and uh, all their their sleeping bedding and uh, utensils and tent, uh, all their tent stakes and, and tents, and so that's where they found Saul. So they ran and brought him from there, and when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And Samuel said to all the people, do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? There is no one like him among all the people. So all the people shouted and said, long live the king. Now, in Hebrew, that's not what they said. Long live the king, because this is uh, New King James, which there's no reason to, to change it out of the old King James. Long live the king is an English slang expression. It means the same thing. Uh, the, the Hebrew words literally, though, mean may the king live. That's that's what it, it literally means. But it, to have been said at this time, it has the same meaning as, as when, when the British talk about their monarchy and says long live the king or long live the queen. Okay. Well, let's talk about Saul. And you see there in the, in the, the picture, it, He's taller than everybody else. He's easily recognizable. He had striking physical superiority. He was head and shoulders taller than anybody else. He was modest. Naive is what he, some people would say. But he spoke plainly and directly. He was generous. He was gracious in enthronement. Uh, there's a passage that we'll touch on that I had covered yet. Uh, Long-suffering and not given to retribution toward his naysayers and detractors. It's kind of hard to believe he'd have uh, naysayers and detractors, huh? 
but they were, and we'll we'll see that in just a minute. Everything is going Saul's way. He's a strong warrior physique. He's modest and humble. New changed heart, spiritual power and anointing, meekness to cur meekness has changed to courage, and he's endowed with kingly presence of mind. He's, in other words, he starts thinking in terms of, man, I'm, I'm responsible for a lot of people. I've got to start thinking of, you know, how to how how to act, how how to what is all this going to be? I mean, you just imagine all the questions, but. This is part of how his mind had started changing so he could start thinking in terms of becoming king. What else was in his favor? He had a very loyal cab cabinet. If you read the, the scriptures that we're not covering uh, and you read uh, the in-between passages, it says that a very loyal and loving group of his friends went with him uh, and they intended to be his, his uh, we we call it a cabinet today, but his, his uh what was advisors. It? his advisors? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the main thing was Saul had the guidance and prayers of Samuel backing him up. So, I mean, he had it all in his favor. I mean, he had in his favor that God himself had picked him. Had picked him. Right. Exactly. Goodness. But why was Saul not the qualified king, though? Well, I mean, I know you're going to address this, but I always thought that Saul nor David was the qualified king, that God himself was the qualified king, and that he was just making concessions for people crying out for a king. Well, in a broad sense, that could be said that way, just like Jesus said, you know, Moses knew the hardness of your heart, and, you know, you, he allowed for, you know, men to have many wives and uh, you know, you, in a broad sense, that's that's true. But David was prophesied to be the king out of the book of Ruth, if you remember. So why is Saul? David was the tenth generation after uh, Pezor, Pezor. Right. Okay. Perez. Perez. That's it. Mm -hmm. Perez. But so why why is Saul the interim king then? Is he to show? Well, the way not to do it. I mean, what is why? I don't understand this part. All right, <clears throat> in a, in a very real sense, we can say, "There's that dead gum seed war again." He can't. Satan gets a hold of the people of Israel. And I mean, is he not a king corrupted or a king um, that could have been? Let's call him the king that could have been. Okay. But there's still something that's intrinsically wrong with it. Okay, what, what is, is that? It? It's got to be his lineage. He, he was the, of the tribe of Benjamin. He's not supposed to be of the tribe of Benjamin. The king is, the the Messiah is supposed to come from the tribe of Judah. That's right. Okay. He is supposed to come from the house of David. All those prophecies. Right. Remember? Right, okay. right, right. So why did God allow this? Well, David was probably two years old at the time. He was a child. All right. That's why I'm saying. Could could we not turn around and lay this at the feet of the seed war? We Once could. again, Satan is trying to interfere to make sure the Messiah is never born. We could also lay this at the feet <laughs> of a stiff-necked people who continuously demanded a king so to keep them satisfied until David could come of age to come and take the kingship, he gave them Saul. <laughs> well, how many times? Am I wrong? No. Okay. As a matter of fact, I think you're making the very point I wanted to make. Okay, go ahead. And that is sometimes, you know, God wants to give me a Cadillac, but I, I mean, I, I start asking for a Chevrolet and I just won't shut up about a Chevrolet. And, you know, I, I don't find out until later he gives me the Chevrolet. But he says, hey, I had a Cadillac for you, but you want the Chevrolet? Go ahead. Maybe so. Go ahead. Go ahead with the scripture instead of the Cadillac. <laughs> the prophecy of Jacob was that the scepter, the kingship, would not depart from Judah until the Messiah has come. That's Genesis chapter 49. What does Genesis chapter 49 actually say about that? 
This is this is Jacob talking now. <clears throat> when he is, if you go back and read Genesis forty nine, he is talking about. Um, excuse me, Jacob is basically giving giving a. Let's just, let's just say he's putting labels on all of the tribes. And on the tribe of Judah, he says some things, but specifically he says this, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Everybody, nobody disputes that Shiloh means Shiloh the Messiah. Means the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Samuel knew that Saul could not have been the king of destiny because Saul, Samuel knew that Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin. Who picked Saul? God did. God picked Saul. God picked Saul. <clears throat> what was the impetus for a king at this time? Like you said, it was the stiff-necked people who by their sinning, God called, God flat out said they sinned when they demanded a king. Not that he they weren't going to get a king because he had prophesied that. Israel was going to be he, he run did, by a king but I think, back in Deuteronomy. I think so much of that sin was that, uh, you know, we've studied about the pagan nations and how they all had their own king. Yes. And they, God was going to be the king for them. And so for them to keep crying out for a, I guess you could say earthly or, ma you know, man king, that, 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 that had a lot to do with it because they wanted one to prop up and say, well, here's our king. Yeah, they wanted one they could point to and say, there's our king sitting on his throne. Yeah. He's the one that rules everything. But, but the like, influence of those pagan nations and their kings, I think. And that's because they did not grasp that behind those pagan nation kings was a pagan little G God that was pulling all the strings. Yeah, I know. They didn't know that. Well, that's that's the influence of Satan over over them. Mm -hmm. It led them to sin. So, were they going to have a king? Yes, it was prophesied in Deuteronomy. But they demanded the king too soon, because God had His eyes on David. Yeah. But David was a little kid at the time. Less than a little kid. If he was born at all. Born. Yeah, I don't even know if he's born at all. I, have to study that. Because look how young he was when Goliath came along. So it was destined that even though he gave them who at first had a, you know, started off great, he basically let them have a defective king because he was from the tri tribe of Benjamin, not the tribe of Judah. Mm. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to give y'all some extra history here just because it plays out by extra biblical evidence, okay? The scepter departed. And what that means is the absolute rule of life and death over the tribes of Israel. The scepter actually departed in about 6 or 7 AD by the Roman pro procurator named Caponius. The legal power of the Sanhedrin, which until then... When they re, I mean, even when they were in, in uh, exile, mm -hmm. they were left to rule themselves. And so if somebody had committed a capital offense, then their, their death could be ordered. Okay. They were never without the ability to execute capital punishment. Okay. Up until six or seven AD, when this pro, uh, procurator came in power and he basically said, you, the Sanhedrin, no Israeli court of any type could carry out death sentences. That's why they had to go to them about Jesus. That's why they had to ask the Romans to crucify Jesus mm -hmm. because they did not have the legal power to do it themselves. Okay. okay. The Jewish historian Josephus even addressed this issue in his writings. Okay. I'm not through covering this for y'all. When the members of the Sanhedrin found themselves deprived of their rule of law over life and death in the nation of Israel, they covered their heads with ashes 
exchanged their fine linens for sack sackcloth and cried out, woe unto us for the scepter has departed from Judah and the Messiah has not come. They actually believe that the Torah has been broken. That's not really true. No, because they failed to acknowledge that there might be a young carpenter's son living in the city of Nazareth at the time, learning the trade of carpentry from his father. I know I didn't know that, but they were panicked about that. They were panicked about it because they're sitting there going, the word, of, word of God has failed. The word of God has failed. That's what well, they thought. They did. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and having that thought, I mean, that problem probably drove them even that much further into secular secularism and trying to, to live by, you know, know, secular rules with the with the Roman government. Okay. They found a way around a lot of other things. I don't know why they couldn't find a way around that. Well, they couldn't because like we know, they had to ask the Romans to crucify Jesus because right. they, they didn't have the power to do it. Right. Now, I made reference to the fact that Josephus actually referenced the fact that the, quote, scepter uh, departed from Israel uh, in some of his writings. And here that is. After the death of the procurator Festus, when Albinus was about to succeed him, the high priest Ananias, I believe it's really Arrhenius is who that is. I think that's a misspelling. Considered it a favorable opportunity to assemble the Sanhedrin. He therefore caused James, the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, and several others to appear before this hastily assembled council and pronounced upon them the sentence of death by stoning. By stoning. All the wise men and strict observers of the law who were at Jerusalem expressed their dis disapprobation of this act. Some even went to Albinus himself, who had departed to Alexandria, to bring this breach of the law under his observation and to inform him that Arrhenius had acted illegally in assembling the Sanhedrin without the Roman authority. What had happened? They assembled the Sanhedrin. They didn't have the, the authority to, to issue death. Uh, uh, the death penalty. They couldn't issue the death penalty nor could they carry it out. Right. But they did in this instance. And Josephus, a Jewish historian, writing in his book of Antiquities, chapter 20, called this out as an act of the Sanhedrin. So it, it was no secret that that's what they believed was, was that the, the uh, scepter had departed Israel and the Messiah had not been born. That's what they didn't know. Saul is tested. Then Nahash, this is chapter 11. Then Nahash, the Ammonite, came up and encamped against or besieged Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, make a covenant with us and we will serve you. And Nahash, the Ammonite, answered them, on this condition, I will make a covenant with you that I may put out all your right eyes and bring reproach on all Israel. Let's pause there a second to understand what's going on. Here. Put out everybody's right eye. Like everybody's going to be a pirate. I mean, everybody's going to be. All the men of fighting age would basically become pirates. Okay. Gosh. Now, if you remember. I didn't remember this part. Yeah. If you remember uh, back in uh, Judges, when they uh, uh, took a captive, back in the, the book of Judges, they took a captive and. They uh, cut off his big toe and cut off his thumbs. Yeah. And he said, I've got 70 kings that I defeated who who lay around my my feast table uh, eating, eating scraps wherever they can because I defeated them and I cut off their thumbs and I cut off their big toe. What was that to do? Well, number one, they couldn't, uh, they could pull a bow, but they couldn't hold a bow. Okay, and by cutting off their big toes, it meant they couldn't run very fast. Well, what about the gouging out the right eye? I don't be able to shoot at them. Uh -huh. Well, remember, the vast majority of people were, were right handed, so they held the shield with their left hand. Okay, and so they could peek around their shield with what? Oh, my goodness, their right eye. And so, if you gouged out the right eye, they got to peek all the way, they would around. be forced to hold. 
with the right arm and hand, and they would have to fight us with a sword in their left hand, which was naturally their weak hand. So it all had to do with, with basically putting the, all the men of fighting age in such a condition that they would never be able to wage any meaningful rebellion. They would be disabled. They would be disabled, <clears throat> yes. Okay. Hmm. And basically by doing that, you, you're submitting that, you know, for as long as I live, I'm going to be subject to your rule because there's no way I can fight back. Okay. And that's why it's put in there and bring reproach on all Israel. Then the elders of Jabesh said to him, hold off for seven days that we may send messengers to all the territory of Israel. And then if there's no one to save us. We will come out to you. So the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul and told the news in the hearing of the people. And all the people lifted up their voices and wept. Now there was Saul coming behind the herd from the field. What did we say about Saul a while ago? He knew he'd been anointed. He knew he'd been announced to the people. He's still out there with the donkeys. But he still don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. He's been filled with the Spirit. He's been anointed, not only by Samuel, been anointed by he's God. He's just carrying on his normal what he did before. He's had some great praise and worship experience, but he still don't know where he's going to be going. So what does he do? He goes back to his home. And yeah, he's got, he knows he's king. And he's got some, some friends uh, and advisors that are there with him. <laughs> but again, what's he supposed to be doing? All he knows to do is get up in the morning and go start tending to his herds. Okay. And Saul said, what troubles the people that they weep? And they told him the words of the men of Jabesh. Then the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard this news, and his anger was greatly aroused. All right? And then you see, see the points I put there. The Spirit of God came upon him, supernatural empowerment just as before, and he sprang into action doing what? Calling up a militia of all the tribes to assemble at Bezek. Well, that tells me one thing, though. The Spirit of God came on him before he prophesied with the prophets, but it did stay on him. Yeah. it It's coming as needed. The Spirit of God is coming upon Saul. It's not like a believer where we have the Spirit, the Holy Spirit within us. Well, that, I, I've said that many times. The Old Testament is, is marked by the Holy Spirit being outside of a man. Mm -hmm. outside of a woman because it would come upon them right mm -hmm. and it could leave mm -hmm. right in the new testament we are told that not only will the spirit teach us guide us lead us comfort it us. will be with comfort us the spirit will be with us and the spirit will be in us in us mm -hmm. and paul says i am persuaded and he is able to keep that which is which i've committed unto him against that day mm -hmm. meaning we're brand new. That, that's Paul speaks of having the Holy Spirit inside of us is like us being branded as Christians. That's our brand. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's how we're known because we, we know we're saved because we have the Spirit in us. Jesus said it will happen. Paul confirmed that it does happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the difference. And that's a good point that you make. All right. The Ammonites, where are they? Right here, okay? There's the Dead Sea. There's the Sea of Galilee, Dead Sea. The Ammonites are the people that wanted to poke an eye out of everybody? Correct. Okay. And where are the Ammonites right here? Ammonites are over here in the east. Remember, the Philistines came from the west, came from this coastal flat area down here, Okay. But the Ammonites are right in this area, right in here. And this is basically a far outpost of the nation of Israel at the time, okay? They are actually on the west side, east side of the, uh, or at least on the Jordan River. That is Jabesh Gilead. Saul passes his first test, and the fear of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out with one consent. When he numbered them in Bezek, the children of Israel were 300,000, 
and the men of Judah 30,000. So it was on the next day that Saul put the people in three companies, and they came into the midst of the camp in the morning watch and killed Ammonites until the heat of the day. And it happened that those who survived were scattered so that no two of them were left together. Basically, when you wipe them out, all you've got are single stragglers. You've done some major wiping out. Then the people said to Samuel, Who is he who said, Shall Saul reign over us? Bring those men that we may put them to death. But Saul said, Not a man shall be put to death this day, for today the Lord has accomplished salvation in Israel. Then Samuel said to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. So all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. There they made sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord, and there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. Okay, so that is the, I see that your comment under there now, but, um, but shall Saul reign over us? That's kind of a sarcastic comment. It was sarcastic. Okay, if, so, if you go back so to if first you read Samuel, this, who is... Who's those people that said, shall Saul reign over us? Yeah, It's kind of like that. It says, bring them here. We're going to kill them. But look at him. He's done great. Well, in 1 Samuel 10, verse 27, everybody heard him. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's it's if you, if you read it in context, they're not even saying it under their breath. It's a small group. Who basically says, "Well, Saul can reign over somebody, but he ain't reigning over us." But Saul looks like he's doing good here. He's giving the Lord credit and saying, yes. "The Lord is the one did this. Nobody's dying today of our people. God did. This is God's victory." Well, and in, in in that time when it first happened, Saul heard him, and it clearly says Saul basically bit his tongue. He just ignored him. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Good. Now, just to show you, here is where the Ammonite army was. They were besieging Jabesh Gilead. They had come to Saul down here at Gebeah, and Saul told the Israelites to assemble at Bezek, and he assembled 330,000 men of Israel of fighting age. So they had to go from Bezek to Jabesh Gilead, and they did it in less than a, a full night. In other words, he put them on the road, and they marched all night. And uh, starting uh, just before daybreak, they whooped the Ammonites uh, until the sun got so hot they couldn't. Uh, th their arms were getting tired. Okay. Saul is confirmed and the people are challenged. Samuel said to all Israel, indeed, I have heeded your voice and all that you, and we're going into chapter 12 now. I have heeded your voice and all that you said to me and have made a king over you. And now here's the king walking before you. And I'm old and gray headed. And look, my sons are with you. I've walked before you from the, from my childhood to this day. Here I am witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey have I taken? Whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed? From whose hand have I received any bribe with which to blind my eyes? I will restore it to you. Fact of the matter is, Samuel you knew nobody could truthfully accuse him of any, any of that. And they said, you have not cheated us or oppressed us, nor have you taken anything from any man's hand. Then he said to them, the Lord is witness against you and his anointed is witness to this day that you have not found anything in my hand. And they answered, he is witness. Now, because Saul had won such a resounding and quick victory for the Israelites at the far outpost of the nation. Oh, I've already covered that one. I didn't change that. That's okay. Sorry. That's all right. My bad. Now, I, uh, what I'm trying to get to here, though, is Samuel is saying... I'm an honest man, and I want everybody here to testify to that. Yeah, because if y'all got something against me, I want to hear it. Okay, but why is this Saul is confirmed? It's fixing to happen. It's fixing to happen. Okay, go ahead. I said, and the people are challenged. Go ahead. And now this is where Samuel is challenging the people. 
He, re he recounted his ministry, reminded the people of his faithfulness to them and to Jehovah. Samuel then recounted the history of the nation and pointedly brought up their focus on their historical sins for which they paid heavily during the judges period and their current sin by asking for a king. Samuel called down a heavy thunderstorm during a regularly dry time of the year. It was the harvest time. Harvest time uh, is not a wet season. Harvest time, it is long periods of no rain. Okay? But they had a, a very unusual heavy thunderstorm as a sign that what he was saying was true and the people were convicted of their sins. In other words, it said the scripture says they greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. They're standing there convicted of the fact that everything Samuel was telling them, both them personally and then them as a group, as tribes, and then them as a nation, that Samuel was telling them all the truth and that they had sinned. The people admitted their sin. Samuel reassured them of Jehovah's grace. Their faithfulness and obedience would assure them of Jehovah's blessings. They had sinned, but God would overlook it if they would obey. Samuel sought to direct a fresh recognition of the sovereignty of Jehovah over Israel and the need for the people to worship, obey, and praise Jehovah as the provider of all they have. Sometimes God allows us to have what we ask for even if it's not his preference for us. Now, is that a good takeaway from what we've heard so far? So in light of the fact that he's letting them have Saul as a king, uh, he is reminding them that they sinned because they asked for him. But, and that they should turn their thoughts and praise and worship toward God. Yes. Not, not as it, I don't think he's telling them, uh, do away with the king and go back. I just think he's saying, let him be king, but you are still required to well, worship Jehovah. You don't get to transfer all your worship now to Saul. Yeah, you don't get to just throw it all away. Yeah, you don't get right. to start worshiping a man. Well, we're fixing to look at our last slide of the night, and you have hit it on the nail. Good, I'm Even glad though, I got it. You've done a good job of setting it up. God's grace is declared. This is the end of chapter 12. Samuel said to the people, do not fear. You have done all this wickedness, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Do not turn aside, for then you would go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver, for they are nothing. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. Where did we first hear that? We hear that Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9. How many times did Moses and Aaron argue with God, or at least appear to be arguing with God? God, you can't wipe them out. Your name's tied to them. It's going to be such they'd a... Say, they'd say, don't burn them up. Don't burn them all up. What will people say? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. These are your people. So... It has pleased the Lord to make you his people. In other words, Samuel is, is putting a new twist on those arguments, mm -hmm. okay? Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. He's saying, look, what you've done is done. Can't be undone. Move forward. And I'm going to be there with you because I'm not going to cease from praying for you. Because he feels like to do that would be a sin. For him, it would be a sin. Remember, I told you, any reference, any any preacher, teacher, you hear talking about Samuel, Samuel will always be referred to as the praying prophet. Mm -hmm. Okay? But I will teach you the good and right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. Your king. Here's 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 the the parting lesson here. Israel's past could not be undone. The history of the people could not be rewritten. But their future, Samuel is telling them, is untainted and could still be devoted to Jehovah. 
What's the lesson for us? 